The Holy Gospel is taken from the 20th chapter of Luke. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a brother, if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her, and so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the, re in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, he is God not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them are alive. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Let's pray. Precious God, still our hearts and minds that we might hear what you have to say to us today in worship, in word, in song, and sacrament for our lives as your people. Amen. Chapter 20 in Luke is filled with trick questions. You know those kind of trick questions. You know those you re that if you respond to them, you're in trouble either way. You know like, did you kick your dog yesterday? If you say no, you've only ruled out yesterday. The Humane Society still might get you for kicking your dog today or last week because that hasn't been ruled out, has it? Responding to a trick question is a no-win proposition. Luke's connected three trick questions in chapter 20, each of which leads us to new truths about Jesus and God's reign, which Jesus came to inaugurate. So let's review those trick questions and the new truths that Jesus was teaching. In verses 1 through 8, Jesus is in the temple and people there inquire about the source of Jesus' authority. Now, that's important because you understand that rabbinic arguments back then were won by the rabbi that one could cite the most rabbinic sources, teachers before him, and the most prestigious rabbis. So, what's your authority, Jesus? And in response, Jesus asked a trick question, the first one in the chapter. He said, first, you tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? And the people recognized this was a trick question, a no-win proposition. They said, among themselves, if we say from heaven, then he'll say, well, why didn't you believe John? But if we say of uh, human origin, then all the people will stone us because they are persuaded John was a prophet. So the people took the safe way out. We don't know, they said. <laughs> and the truth is, of course, that John was called by God to come and to go and to prepare the way for Messiah. And then in verses 20 to 26, the scribes and the Pharisees had sent emissaries to ask Jesus a trick question. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? You're familiar with that story, right? If Jesus says yes, then they accuse him of being in league with the Romans and, and the occupying forces, the enemy. 
If he says no, they go to Pilate and the Roman officials and say, Jesus is a traitor. He's a, encouraging people not to pay taxes. But Jesus outsmarted them. He asked for a coin. Remember that? He says, whose image is on the coin? And they say, Caesar. He says, well, it must be Caesar's. Give it to Caesar. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And the truth we learn about ourselves is we know the coin has the image of Caesar engraved or stamped on it. We have the thumbprint, the image of God in us. We learned that way back in Genesis. We are created in the image of God. We are to give ourselves to God. Today's reading is the third trick question in this chapter. The small religious sect of Jewish leaders, the Sadducees, pose an outlandish question to Jesus. It's outlandish from the outset because they don't believe about resurrection anyway, and they're asking about it. Basically, their trick question says if a woman marries seven times and doesn't ever produce a, a child to carry on the first brother's lineage, and she dies, in the resurrection, which they don't even think exists, whose wife will she be? Now they're asking about Leverite marriage. Leverite's the Hebrew word brother-in-law. So brother-in-law marriage, whose purpose was to continue the deceased brother's name and supposedly to also provide for the widow's well-being and care. And the brother-in-law performing Leverite marriage would inherit all of his deceased brother's wealth. Sounds like the brother-in-law is the one that benefits in this arrangement, doesn't it? But rather than wading in to the morass of their ridiculous trick question, the reply of Jesus teaches us truths about heaven, the resurrection, and God's kingdom. Truth number one, I think. The Sadducees they're looking at the resurrection in heaven. They're applying the rules of this world to the resurrection. Their question assumes death, marriage, babies, and so forth continue in the resurrection just like they have to continue, just like they are in this earth, this life. But resurrection life has different rules. Their concept of God is too small. That God can't do something new. For when we are resurrected, we are resurrected to eternal life. And there's no death. There's no need for marriage. No need to make babies to carry on human society or family names. So the law about Leverite marriage has no place. No need for it in the resurrection. The second truth is that they, Moses himself who is the key theological source and authority for the Sadducees, they focus only on the Pentateuch. Moses himself showed the truth of the resurrection during that burning bush encounter in Exodus 3. For God speaks in the bush about being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And these ancestors live in the presence of God who is only a God of the present. A God of life. Remember the name that God revealed to Moses. I am. The truth is that God is a God of the living because all those resurrected live as children in God's presence here and now for eternity. And a third truth to lift up is that in the resurrection we see that women are no longer treated as property or second-class people whose primary purpose is to serve men and to bear children to carry on the man's lineage. Women and all who are resurrected, Jesus says, are like angels and children of God, equally loved, all living a full life free in God's presence forever. You see, in the resurrection, God's reign is perfected. There's no death. There's no need for marriage, no heartache of divorce, no hierarchies of human society, be they based on economics, ethnic background, skin color, age, sex, gender, or anything else that 
humans have erected as boundaries and divisions. Everyone lives and is loved as a beloved child of God, one family of God. And that's what Jesus kept demonstrating and teaching, isn't it? Remember the Samaritan woman at the well, his disciples were appalled. One, that he would talk to a strange woman outside his family. And two, that he would talk to a Samaritan of all people. He crossed that boundary because we're one family. Or the woman caught in adultery, the law was set up for the benefit of men. Or they conveniently forgot about the punishment of man. Jesus says, go and sin no more. Because nobody who was, was sinless to cast the stone. In the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon in the Plain in Luke, um, Jesus lays out, I think, how the kingdom of God works. Remember, remember Jesus crossing boundaries and doing the forbidden to touch lepers, to heal them and welcome them back into community. And even just the variety of disciples that Jesus called. A traitorous tax collector, a rebellious zealot, fisherman, a whole wide variety. You and I, we have been called in baptism to follow Jesus, to emulate Jesus in our daily lives. And in doing that, we help make the reign of God present here and now. When we follow Jesus, However difficult that might be, we are living a new life. We are living in God's kingdom as it breaks into this world through us, in us, and around us. For whenever God's good and gracious will is done, the kingdom is there. And it's not bound by the divisions in this world. It crosses and shatters them. Three of the commitments we're, we make when we affirm our baptism and when parents stand at the font for the baptism of their little ones. Three of those commitments relate to, directly to living in God's kingdom here and now. As we say, they're outer gifts that we can observe in people's lives and our lives. We are to proclaim the good news of God and Christ through word and deed. We are to serve all people following the example of Jesus. And thirdly, we are to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. The outer ways of baptism, you see, these are the ways that we commit to live out our faith, to live as disciples so that people around us see our faith in action benefiting other people as we share in making the kingdom of God present. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Martin Luther taught that we are not only praying for God's kingdom to come now, but also we are praying that we might be a part of that kingdom's coming and presence here and now. The trick questions that Luke records teach us important characteristics about God and God's reign. The good news is that we don't have to conform and live under divisive, repressive, and sometimes oppressive rules of this world. For in Christ, you, we have been freed from those sinful structures. We have been invited, or as confirmation students learned during our retreat this weekend, we have been called, gathered, and sent to live according to the rules of God's kingdom here and now. May the Holy Spirit first pour it into your heart at baptism, stir you to cross boundaries as you bring the good news of the reign of Christ to life each day as you live into being the disciple that God is calling you to be. Amen.